So tonight what I want to talk about is how to grow in the word. About a year ago, I did a teaching on how to grow in the word and I, I laid a foundation and that's there on my Shepherd's Delight channel. And I never got to teach this follow up sharing, which is part. It really is part two of that teaching, uh, probably a year to the day, um, literally of, of part one. And so what I want to look at tonight is how do we as believers grow in the word? How do we grow in the things of God? And we're going to look at various actions that the scriptures direct us to do so that we can grow. And but first of all, let's start by looking at attitude. So let's go to first Corinthians chapter three. And I'm starting from the point of view here as people just really fresh into the word of God. So kind of like taking it from the beginning, really. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Paul wanted to share many things with them, but he recognised they were still infants in Christ. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I know this verse will be familiar to you, but it picks up the same thread that Paul was talking about to the Corinthians. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So we have to ask ourselves, do we long for the pure spiritual milk that we may grow thereby? Let's go to the book of Proverbs, chapter one. And the first attitude that is an absolute bedrock if we want to grow in God and in the word of God is respect for God. And in Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No, it doesn't. It says it's the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> you know, there is another verse that says it's the beginning of wisdom, knowledge and wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord, that's an attitude within our hearts. If we do not have an awesome respect for God, you, you, you can't learn anything. You know, this might sound a, a, a strange analogy, but let's say you go to a dating agency on, a, on a, one of these apps, right? You're looking for a relationship, right? Now, everyone's, you know, I'm not saying anything here, but let's say you go on a dating app and you look at the profiles and the pictures of what you're interested in and you read about the profile, their person, you know, what type of person they are, their likes, their interests, you see your photographs. And let's say there's somebody you like the look of. And their profile, you that you like, their interests, etc. And you maybe you start texting, and there's, you know, back and forth going on. There comes a point where you want to meet the person. See, the whole point of the profile and the texts and the messages is to then meet the person. The the profile and the the texting back and forth. They come from the person, but they're not the person. The Bible are the letters from God. They're the instruction. They're the profile. 
They teach us about what God is, who God is, what his characteristics are, what his, his nature is, what he expects from his children. But you, you don't fall in love with the letters. You fall in love with God behind the letters. It's God who we are to have a fear of, a respect, a love, an adoration. Like Jesus Christ said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name because Jesus had the utmost respect for God. God's name, Yahweh, is hallowed, it's holy. He's the one we have to have a fear of. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You could quote Ephesians from 1, 1 to 6, whatever. Big deal if you haven't got the fear of the Lord. It's not if our knowledge of the scriptures do not lead us to the love of God, the fear of God, the respect of God, so that we genuinely from our hearts say, hallowed be thy name then we're missing something. The whole point of scripture is to teach us about God so that we can love God. We don't fall in love with the academics of scripture. We fall in love with God. He's the one we want to please. He's the one that we are to be to his praise and glory. Let's go to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, a, a very well-known verse, I believe, verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. See, we receive that word of God, that instruction, and it, it's, it, it's grafted into us. You know, the gardeners amongst you know that you, you can take a branch and graft it into the trunk of another tree. And it's you, you do everything you need to do and it's grafted in. So it feeds, that branch feeds from the trunk, from that tree. We are to receive the word of God. It's to be engrafted into us. So that word becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our thinking. It becomes the way we, it becomes our perspective. We judge right from wrong according to the scriptures. That's where the knowledge comes in. But that's not the, you know, the point of the knowledge is that then our lives change. So that we live to the praise of uh, and glory of God. But. So if we start from a point of view where we don't have a fear of the Lord, seriously, we need to ask God to help us if we have difficulty with that. And it's one of the things I've learned and have heard taught many times is if we don't get it, if something doesn't sit with us, let's go to God, ask him. Let's ask him to help us so that we can understand right let's start looking at some actions let's go to isaiah 34 and the first action is read your bible the best way to grow in the things of god is to read the words of god in isaiah 34 and in verse 16, we're going to read the first bit. Seek and read from the book of the Lord. What a wonderful sentence. Seek and read from the book of the Lord. You know, let's go to the Gospel of Mark. There's three, three occasions. I've listed three occasions here where Jesus responds to various people. And he's, he's saying to them, have you not read? So 
the Gospel of Mark chapter 2 and in verse 25 2.25 so this is Jesus talking to these people and he said to them have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry and he and those that were with him this is regarding eating sheaves of wheat on the Sabbath day so he's just going back to them saying have you not read See, there's some questions that you don't need to ask because you've already thought through the scriptures and you realize the answer. So you don't need to have empty, wasted words because you've already figured it out. But Jesus is saying to these guys, have you never read? Uh, I'll read these to you in Mark 12, verse 10. He says, have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's saying to them again, have you not read? You know, that, that pivotal line there in Isaiah, seek and read from the book of the Lord. They were masters of knowledge of the Old Testament. Yet had they taken that instruction and digested it and thought and meditated upon it. And we'll, we'll see some other outgrows from that. Um, these are all in Mark in Mark 12 26 Jesus says as for the dead being raised have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him saying I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob once again he's saying have you not read you should what he's saying is you should know this stuff these were masters of Israel leaders of Israel you should know this because you should have read. So another action. So we've talked about reading the Bible. Another action we should take is meditate. So once we read the Bible, we should take time and think about it. Let's go to Psalms chapter one. You know, when we, we learn the word of God, because we long for that pure spiritual knowledge and we read. And when we're reading, we're to take time to meditate, to think about the word of God that we've read. In Psalm number one and in verse one, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord and he meditates upon it day and night. It's in there and he's thinking about it. And as I've said before, for you and I are blessed with the Holy Spirit. We'll see this later on, but it's the spirit that connects the dots for us. The spirit within us, God's spirit, God's teaching us when we can meditate on the word of God and, you know, read it and think about it and think what we know about the circumstances and other scriptures to build a picture. We think about it and that's when sometimes the light bulbs go on and we think, ah, I, I see it. I see what this truth is saying. And. You know, when the children of Israel were going into the land of Canaan, God says to Joshua, says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. You know, the scriptures teach us that the heart is of all things most wicked and most devious. We cannot trust the heart of man because it will go its own way. That's why God gives us the scripture that says, you do what this says. God knows the way between truth and error, what's right and what's wrong. And he directs us to do it his way. Whenever man goes off to do it his own way, it always ends in disaster. That's because that's the difference between God and man. God is 
all knowing and knowledgeable and he knows the right thing to do we if we follow our own heart's desires we'll end up you know not usually not in the best place but we keep our lives between the tracks you know we keep it on the path god so tells us many times don't do not lean to the left nor to the right but stay on the path and we all go to the left and the right you know because we're not perfect but we keep bringing ourselves back and the the reading the bible the meditating on the scriptures help us to build strength to keep on the right path as i was studying this um i came across this quote of the four C's of Christian meditation that I thought was quite good. Approach God through faith. And the four C's of Christian medica med medication, <laughs> meditation. <laughs> yeah, is that a proverbial slip? Yeah. Um, concentrate, consider, converse, and commit. You know, the scriptures require our concentration and to to consider what the scriptures say and converse talk about it talk with others because you know other people might know more than we do oh what a shock and then you you make up your mind and then just commit to it you 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 get to that point where you commit to what the scriptures say and let's go to matthew chapter 7 I think this is one of my favorite things that over the years I have come to. It's sort of like one of those things within me, which is ask, seek and knock. And let's go to Matthew chapter seven and in, we'll pick it up in verse seven. You know, I was saying before, if we have trouble, if if we have trouble thinking to ourselves, well, you know, do I really love God? Do I know that I love God? How do I know if I love God? Am, am I obeying the word of God the way I should? I'm, I'm, you know, I need help. To go to God with those things. It's not an intellect. We, we turn it too much into an intellectual exercise. But like you know it's like the dating agency you don't go by the you know what's written on the computer screen you go to the person we go to god and ask for his help and th this really shows god's heart on this this thing verse 7 ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him. If we're going to God to ask, to seek, to knock, is God going to refuse us? And I tell you what, there is something about the way God works with us. God will give us what we need. Sometimes what we need is not what we think we want. Or what we want is not necessarily what we need. And sometimes we have to wait and be patient. But God does answer those prayers. We can rely on God to give us the answer we need. You know, there's some things in the past I've wanted to study. And I'm doing what I can to study. But there's just a brick wall in front of me. And and then I, I so it kind of just comes to an end. And then something else opens up and God works in my heart in a different way. 
and then I, you realize that God, God's teaching us what we need to learn. And then sometimes several years later, the thing you wanted to study, it just, the, the wall is gone. The, the, the clouds are lifted and you just see the path and you think, ah, oh, there it is. Boom, boom, boom. Ask, seek and knock and God will answer. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Absolutely fantastic verses these are. These are like those, those nuggets of gold that we keep cashing in on. <laughs> Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith, without believing, it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We are to seek God in faith. That's when we get our answers. And what does it mean to seek God with faith? It's an honest, open conversation with God. It's an honest, open trust. It's an honest, open God. I don't understand this. Please teach me. It's nothing. You know, it, it, it's pretty plain and simple. It's the honest evaluation of what's going on with a quest, a yearning to move forward. It's not like you reach this state of somehow mental and spiritual nirvana and you think, oh, I believe. I, I don't know if that, I don't know if anybody thinks even that way. But sometimes I think we we can think that faith is just this pureness of state of mind, of heart that we are trying to attain. Yet the reality of it is it's basic and simple. Which, which path are we... Where is our heart looking? Where is my mind looking? Is it on the things of God or is it on the things of the earth, the things of the world? What am I yearning for? If I'm yearning for the things of the world, but want the things of God, then I need to change. And it's a process. I need to start making a decision. Read my Bible. Think about what I'm reading. What you're looking at, you're far more likely to think about, to concentrate on. You know, that f those fantastic verses in Philippians. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We can't dwell on where we were. It's, it's always a looking forward. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. It's moving forward and it's forgetting, it's denying, not letting the past dictate my future. I dictate my future by concentrating on the things of God and trying to be obedient in directing my life in that manner. You know, sometimes it's like you go, to, if you read before you go to sleep, you know, do, am I going to read my Bible tonight? Or am I going to read my novel? And maybe you read both. You know, there's, there's no harm in doing both. And But sometimes we have to make that decision. And I, I typically read my Bible in the morning. But sometimes, you know, I just make myself like, just read a chapter. Keep, keep, keep the things of God up there. So... Let's go to the, the next action, and I'm probably aware that I'm going along, going a long time here. But prayer. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one. So we've talked about read, read the word, meditate on the word, 
and ask, seek and knock with faith to go to God for answers. And then in prayer, in Ephesians 1 verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward, toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. What can God teach us? What can we receive? The spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your hearts being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And the hope that he is, to which he has called us is far a far bigger picture, a far greater thing than just Jesus Christ is coming back. That's that, that's the beginning. The hope is the whole storyline behind that. That's just the beginning. In, I'll read this to you in Colossians 1, 9 and 10. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants them to grow spiritually, just like we read in Paul talking to the Corinthians. I can't speak unto you as a spiritual, but as infants in Christ. And as Peter taught, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Paul is praying that they will be, they will be filled with knowledge and spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? Verse 10 tells us, so so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and, in and increasing in the knowledge of God. I was saying earlier that we read the Bible, we come to God, not for an academic understanding of the scriptures, but so that we can have the fear of the Lord, because that's the beginning of knowledge. That we can have that relationship with God. And it is a relationship. It's back and forth. I'd like you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I read this verse the other morning and it really stuck in my head and heart. And I was reviewing these notes and I thought, I've got to stick this in right here. In 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 5, and I'm reading this one from the NIV translation because it, it just sticks out wonderfully. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The whole point of growing in the word is that we walk in the love of God. God is love. God is light and he wants us to walk. But what does that mean to, to, to walk in love? You know, 1 John teaches us that when we obey God's commands, we are that is love. So the whole of this growing in the word, it doesn't mean you don't need knowledge. You cannot separate love from knowledge, but it means the point of, of all the knowledge, the sincere faith, the sincere believing, a good conscience. Your head does not condemn you because you've been going off on left or right field. Your, your head is a good conscience and a sincere, genuine, non-hypocritical faith. The goal of that is love from those roots, from those foundations of a clear conscience and sincere faith. You get the blossom of genuine love of God. That's the goal. That's the point. That's the purpose. So 
So, where we started, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so let's close on that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and it continues to be the foundation of knowledge. We continue to learn and grow because we continue to have an honest, sincere respect for God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us such wonderful instructions and directions within your word. And Father, although we didn't read it tonight, there's, you teach us that your spirit is there to guide us and to bring to our remembrance the things that you've taught us. God, your word is our instruction in righteousness. But that righteousness is right living and our right living is walking hand in hand in fellowship with you, acknowledging you, God, loving you, worshipping you, because you deserve our whole hearts and lives to be in submission to you. We thank you, God, for being the ever eternal great God. And in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge you, Father. Amen.